Hello and welcome to Stocks Down Under. Today we're joined by Mohammed Ali, the founder of EMAS that was recently acquired by Nanoview. Good morning, Mohammed. I understand it's pretty early where you are at the moment. Yeah, good afternoon, Mark. I mean, uh, uh, thanks a lot for having me uh, now. And uh, yeah, indeed, it's 6 a.m. here. I'm in Egypt, right? So, uh, so yeah, but any, any time for this lovely conversation. All right. Well, thanks for getting up so early. Um, for people that don't know EMAS, can you, at a high level, sort of introduce people to the company, to the technology, and what it does? Absolutely. So EMAS is, is short for Embedded AI Systems, right? So what we are, in its essence, we are a semiconductor design company that targets developing um, AI semiconductor chips that can run at extremely low power. We're talking about in the realms of milliwatts. And the idea here is to take these chips and put it into all of our Internet of Things uh, appliances and applications and even newer kind of devices so that we can enable the running of AI at its full force on the edge without the need to sending the data into the cloud. So that's at a very high level that we're doing right now. So it contains really efficient kind of computing units right, run things very fast and also extremely low power through the innovations at the, at the chip level or the semiconductor level and the interactions between the hardware and the software. Right. So there's the chips that do that sort of thing on the market today. Can you explain how you guys are different? Why is it better or better suited to certain applications maybe? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's start with the big picture. Right? So the, our main goal is to try to get the AI applications, right? Like, I mean, let's say if you want to do some object ticket detection or if you want to do some activity recognition or you want to do some sort of like I mean predictive maintenance, right? In, in many places, for example, some locations that you can't even uh, reach out to, such as uh, car tires, right? So what you want to do here is you want to have a system that can sense the data and perform the AI and give you some sort of like mean insights or information about it before you can take a decision or it can take decision on its own as well. So what, what's happening today is that most of the uh, solution, they will take the data that's measured by the sensors and then, okay, I'm going to send it to the cloud, perform this kind of analysis and get the response back. Now, doing this kind of transmission back and forth adds a lot of challenges. For starter, right, I mean, there's going to be some time constant that you have to account for. So for time-sensitive applications, that's not really going to be helpful, right? Even, even by that, if that's not a problem for you, actually transmitting data actually consumes a lot of energy. And I, I see that being people who would use or rely on, like, with 4G, a, a connection of they see how fast the battery depletes on their mobile phone right through this kind of communication alone. So we are trying to solve this problem by bringing, instead of sending the data to the cloud where the AI is in, we're going to bring the AI very close to where the data is being generated. But to do so, you have to overcome a lot of challenges because these applications are not easily being mapped there. So we managed to get this done. Now, not just we managed to can make it run, but we're running it 20 times or even down to 200 times lower energy. You can run things faster, take a much longer, better lifetime. So you charge your system way less frequent than it used to be. And that would help the system to last for years, right? Without mean changing the battery. And that would be useful in very in remote use cases uh, in top of the mountains, in deep sea uh, uh, explorations, or even as I mentioned before, it's like car tire. Right. Okay. And so, um, so we get a sense of which applications this is good for. How fast is that market growing? And, and what's the size of the market? Uh, the market is actually is growing really rapidly. I mean, the overall uh, semiconductor size for the Internet of Things right, will be like in the tens or even a hundred uh, billion dollars, right? Uh, market size for the chip production alone. Right. So there is a growing need for this kind of chipsets, right? That's already existing in the market to have AI infused into it. And that's expecting even to reach right around 200 plus I mean, within uh, the next five to six years. Right. Um, you just announced a collaboration with Webit Nano, also listed on ASX, to incorporate their reram into your product. How significant is that? What is that? Can you underestimate that the significance of embedding reram rather than MRAM in your products? Um, I mean, okay, so I mean, this actually was a very successful collaboration. I'm really fortunate to be working with uh, WeBit, right, to showcase, right, our system works with uh, VRAM. So a little bit of, uh, I mean, like a quick intro about VRAM is short for resistive memory. And the idea here is that you would be able to store 
uh, the bits, right? Which is basically the basic building block of all of our computing unit, the ones and zeros into different resistance state and that becomes permanent inside this unit. Um, the benefit of having something like such an, uh, an aura, which makes this collaboration really significant is that first of all, this will be a very cheap uh, technology solution as compared to MRAP. Because when you are designing and building this one at the chip level, right, it uses some of the materials that already been compatible with the fabrication processes. MRAM, on the other hand, requires more, uh, quote unquote, uh, exotic materials and uh, more layers of metals to create this kind of magnetization layers. So RAM, in principle, is very cheap and also it can give you a very um, strong distinctive levels between what can you store at a zero and as a one. So what does that mean, right? I mean, okay, so when zero and one is going to be stored in either way. But if you can have this kind of huge distinct differences in levels between zero and one, you can read things very, very quickly. So you would be have a very fast memory that is also non-volatile, cheap, and can also be denser than MRAM. So all of this means that you can have more memory density, not like flash, which is uh, as a backup storage node. This is an actual working memory but also it's not volatile. You can leverage this feature to turn on and off your system very quickly, and you can only supply the energy when the compute is needed. Right. Okay, so in terms of um, uh, rollout and com commercialization, what needs to happen on the technical side of things at EMAS before you can start to generate revenues? Yes, so at the moment now we're showcasing now this our chip can work with, uh, with our RAM. So we can take this as it is and to use it to build POCs with partners, right? So that we can have our own mock-up products. But at the same time, on the technical side, we will need to work closely with WeBit, right? To get this RAM and our, uh, I mean, architecture, our module into a single chip, right? Because then that will reduce the form factor. So instead of having something like the, at the size of the palm of your hand, now it becomes as small as your fingertip. So with something that small, then you can have the use case for different applications. So we need to work together with WeBit closely, hopefully over the course of the next of this year, to create a chip that combines the RAM and EMS technology in a single integrated package, right? And we showcase that now we have both working together and we achieve even more sufficient, uh, more superior energy gain than what we had before. And that will be the key turning point at the same time while we're engaging with uh, potential customers to show the proof of concept, the running their applications with our platform, to be starting to selling it and creating revenue. Because at the end of the day, the nature of EMS business is to supply this chip to companies who create the end products that will be supplied to you with them. Such as being smart glasses, hearing devices, health tracking applications, smart remote controls, et etc. et cetera. Right. Okay. Uh, last question, Mohamed. What's your path to market, basically? So how you mentioned it a little bit already, but how are you engaging with prospects and how do you plan to get on market uh, with the products? So, I mean, the, the thing that I'm a firm believer in is that like now we need to showcase this as working. So as people always said, the proof is in the pudding. So now we have a working product. We're very uh, fortunate to be showcasing this combined uh, demo, right? at one of the world's largest exhibitions uh, for Embedded Systems, which is Embedded World, which will happen, I think, uh, by starting Monday in Germany. So by that, we'll, in we'll showcase that to potential customers, right? And we will try to sign some sort of, like, mean, collaboration agreement or MOUs to get them to test this kind of combined product into their end uh, product solutions. And once that is done, hopefully we can get this forward. Another thing will be taking this, right, and um, uh, reaching out to potential customers in the fields of health tracking, right, and in the fields of uh, component manufacturing for automotives, right, and uh, we already started the conversations with them right now. I'm just like, I mean, I'm not, uh, have the clearest to re release the names yet. Of course, yeah, of course. So, yeah, a lot to look forward to for investors. Uh, Mohammed Ali, thank you very much. All right, thanks, Mark. Yeah, always nice to talk to you.